Uh, I'm Ilya Kuprov, uh, Associate Professor of Chemical Physics at the University of Southampton uh, and the Deputy Editor at the Science Advances magazine. It's mostly computational and it's got to do with the quantum mechanics of spin. All of the processes that we study in magnetic resonance, they need to be modeled and we do it on large supercomputers. Um, those are difficult calculations and most of what we do concerns doing those calculations in a reasonable time, efficient before realistic systems. Yeah, uh, principally, of course, the first important thing is it's non-destructive and it is a standoff measurement technique. You don't need to open the bottle, you don't need to destroy your precious protein. It comes back from the magnet in exactly the same way as you've put it, particularly important for MRI. I mean, because you only have one brain um, and uh, a standoff measurement technique is quite important. But principally, I'd say extraordinary specificity of what we do, right? Atom by atom, we can see them individually. In other methods like optical spectroscopy, infrared, Merzbauer, we are seeing a highly indirect measure of what may or may not be there. You have to sit and think about which particular functional group that is that's vibrating and so on. In magnetic resonance, it is direct. You are seeing this group of atoms and you know it's this group of atoms and you can isolate them really well, particularly in high field magnets from the rest of it. So I'd say the non-destructive nature, the extreme sensitivity, we keep complaining NMR is not sensitive, but it really, really is sensitive for most practical purposes. And selectivity. At the moment, two things. Uh, machine learning, where data processing requires unstable and ill-posed mathematical transformations. In certain cases, the information is in principle contained in the data. It is just, it's very hard to extract. And it turned out that neural networks are unusually, unexpectedly good at extracting that information. So that's part of the research. And then simulation methods. Um, it used to be what mathematicians call exponentially hard to simulate a spin system. And it's the same old problem. Remember the chessboard and grains of rice story from the ancient Persia. And this is what used to be the case with spin. You add a spin and the calculation complexity doubles. And you add another spin and the complexity doubles again. All right, five spins or ten spins down the line, computer goes crash, boom, bang. And uh, much of what we do is about reducing that complexity. And at least in liquid state NMR we have succeeded. So we have introduced the methods with asymptotically cubic, quadratic, and if you're lucky, even linear complexity, which is a bit of an improvement on the exponential complexity situation. So that's the second line of uh, research. And finally, its applications. Uh, we have an interesting status in the magnetic resonance community. If people have run out of explanations as to what just happened, uh, we get the telephone call and we do the modeling. And more often than not, we figure out what just happened. And so it's a bit of a service to the community in that we are the duty theorists uh, for all the inexplicable stuff that goes on. We put it into our machines, into our software. Something interesting turns up, uh, which either explains to the chemists what just happened or guides them in many cases. They would come to us and say, out of these 128 molecules, which one has the narrowest fluorine line winds? We can tell them, and that saves them a lot of synthetic effort because they don't need to synthesize 100 molecules, they only synthesize one. That's the general idea. Depends when, right? So results is a continuous process. Yes, we made some neural networks that solved a few old problems in EPR spectroscopy. We created and released a software package that does these uh, low complexity calculations of what was previously impossible. We solved a few old theoretical problems in relaxation theory of lanthanides. Um, we've cleared up a few mysteries um, about um, mechanisms of cross-relaxation. This was all in collaborations with uh, experimental groups, of course, because uh, it's hard for a theorist to really stumble upon something truly novel, because quantum mechanics was more or less done, uh, you know, by about uh, 1920. 
it's usually things that are related to practical um, applications and um, practical mysteries of what experimentalists come up with. That's an interesting question. This implies that the role of a scientist is to benefit society. It really isn't. Uh, we benefit society as perhaps a side effect of what we do. Uh, it is interesting. But ultimately, we are not driven by anyone's benefit. We are driven by intellectual curiosity. So we found a lot of awesome stuff. Uh, and uh, by a fortuitous coincidence, somebody found it useful. Yes, well, we are in the middle of computational power revolution. If you look at the available computing power, it is truly extraordinary. What I now have on my table back in Southampton is more powerful than the largest supercomputer in the world had been in 2005. So we've, in the space of 20 years, we've gained six orders of magnitude in computing power. So that is the one ongoing revolution that we're in the middle of, that is yielding all of these artificial intelligence advances that you are seeing on the television, that is enabling theoretical modeling of things that was previously entirely out of the question, design of new hardware, uh, on both the console, radio frequency, microwave control side, and on the magnet side, this is all enabled by this computational revolution. New data processing methods, uh, new methods for electronic structure theory, uh, new methods that allow us to not do experiments, but acquire the necessary information in a supercomputer. So I think as revolutions go in science in general and magnetic resonance in particular, I think the current hottest topic has to do with this ongoing extraordinary rise in computing power that is becoming available. That I think for the next 10 years or so is the biggest scientific goldmine of our time.